Welcome, Welcome to, to Avacon. Avacon. Stephen Downs is a specialist in online learning technology and new media. He is the leading voice in online and networking learning. He speaks with pra from practical experience both as a college and university teacher and the author of learning management and content syndication software. Through a 25-year career in the field, Downs has developed and deployed a series of progressively more innovative technologies. Beginning with multi-user domains, or MUDs, in the 1990s, open online communities in the 2000s, and personal learning environments in the, two, uh, in the 2010s. Downs is perhaps best known for his daily newsla newsletter, Old Daily, which is distributed by web, email, and RSS to thousands of subscribers around the world. As a teacher and designer, he is also known as the originator of the massive open online course. As a theorist, he is known as a leading proponent of connectivism, a theory describing how people know and learn using network processes. Downs is also a leading advocate of open educational resources and free learning. Downs is widely recognized for his deep, passionate, and articulate exposition of a range of insights melding theories of education and philosophy, new media, and computer technology. He has published hundreds of articles online and in print, and has presented around the world for academic conferences in dozens of countries on five continents. Everyone, please help me welcome our Avacon keynote, Stephen Downs. Well, hello, everyone. It's a, it's a pleasure to be here with all of you. And I'm seeing on the screen all of your enthusiastic applause. Thank you. Just for fun, and because I can, I'll let you know, I'm actually uh, doing a live hangout of this presentation. Uh, not that uh, you're getting anything there, uh, that other people aren't. There are zero viewers in the live hangout. But if you could see me, I'm actually balancing uh, one computer on top of another computer. And I've got my webcam right now pointed at the screen. So I imagine all the text is backwards, but there's nothing I can do about that. And I've got wires everywhere. Anyhow, so um, now, oh, oh, I see. So I can't, oh, I have to look at my slides to see my slides. I'm still figuring out this environment, so you, you'll have to be kind and gentle to me. And I'm realizing now that I don't have any way of viewing my notes on my slides, so I'm gonna have to wing it as I go. But still, nonetheless, it's great to see all of you here. Uh, some of you are already friends. It's kind of neat. I see the, the little bubble says friends, so I know who to look at kindly and who not to look at kindly. Um, oh, and this is very interesting as well. I see that I see that uh, we're actually producing a transcript of the talk at the bottom of the screen as I talk. So that's a very nice feature. And whoever is providing that, uh, thank you. So the theme of my talk today is virtual worlds on the go. And I want to start the talk by beginning to think about the, the necessary aspect of learning uh, in social networking and learning communities. Uh, this is something that's been talked about for many years. Of course, uh, Dewey talked about it. 
uh, Vitkowski talked about it. Uh, social learning and social networking and learning communities is featured in, for example, situated cognition, and especially in things like communities of practice. Here we're talking about Etienne Wenger uh, and others. The idea here is that learning takes place in an environment. It's an environment where interaction and communication forms part of the overall environment. I'm still getting used to this. Somebody just dis disconnected from my channel. I got so the big question though, when we look at this sort of uh, approach to learning is, is conversation enough? Is communication enough? Is, for example, what we're doing here in this environment, and here I look around at all of you, and we're in a, an environment, it's an immersive environment, but mostly what we're doing is communicating with text and with words. We're talking and maybe showing some pictures. It's well recognized, however, that in learning, there is well the need for deliberate practice. And there's a variety of reasons, of course, you know, on the one hand, the need for practice has to do with the development of skills, of abilities, indeed, even the idea of becoming the thing that you're trying to become. We simply, we do not simply transfer knowledge into our head and suddenly become a physicist. But as well, there's another aspect to the need for deliberate practice. And David Day talked about it in his paper. Uh, the idea here that practice keeps us humble. Uh, practice reminds us of our failures. It reminds us of our inability to always be successful. And the result of practice is that we continue to try to learn, continue to try to become better, and continue to try to reach out to other people to learn what we can learn from them. So we have this idea that is instantiated in environments like this, the virtual world, of communication and interaction, the social dimension of learning. And we also have this idea of the need for deliberate practice, the idea of actually getting our hands dirty, dirty and doing whatever it is that we want to do. Now, I want to talk to you about a talk that I gave, gee, it's 14 years ago now. And it was a talk that I gave in Australia. It was titled From Virtual to Reality. And while I was preparing for that talk, I was walking along the river in Brisbane, Australia, and I saw this boat. Uh, it was 100 years old even then. It had been built in the north of Australia. It was called the Tribal Warrior. And what they were doing at that time is educating people by putting them on this boat, by sailing this boat around Australia and giving them practical everyday instruction and uh, the various things that they needed to do in order to survive, in order to become good sailors, good mariners. And the argument that I presented at that conference in Brisbane, based on the example of the tribal warrior, was that the affordance of online learning really is to take learning out of the classroom and bring it in to the real world. Uh, and and an example like the tribal warrior gave us a perfect context for that because they were able to continue with their studies, their formal studies, their theoretical learning using computers while they were out there on the ocean 
learning very practical skills as well. Real world practice indeed is one of the major advantages that we have today in simulations and associated technologies. Real world practice, such as for example, the Neuro Touch Simulator, which I'm showing here up on the screen. The Neuro Touch Simulator is technology that we developed at NRC. This technology basically gives you the, the feeling of what it's like to do neurosurgery. And I've tried this myself, and it's a, a great experience to try to do. Uh, you have actual implements. They're real-world implements. They, they have weight. They have heft. Uh, and, and you're manipulating those. And you're using some goggles that are, per, that are allowing you to view a three-dimensional screen. And as you use these implements, and in the particular case of neurosurgery that I tried, I'm burning off a cancer tumor on the surface of a brain. You actually feel the resistance of the brain pushing back at you as you attempt to burn it off. And one of the things I learned if I'm a failure as an educator, I have a promising career as a neurosurgeon. Maximum cancer destruction, minimal bleeding. I'm very pleased with myself. But the idea here, what's important here is we're getting real world learning through a simulation, but it's not just a simulation where you put on some goggles like Oculus Rift and, and you know, just watch and, and maybe move around. It's a simulation where the real world itself is a part of the simulation. So that's the opportunity that we've seen for, well, the last decade, the last two decades. Why did that happen? I mentioned that I was doing the uh, <laughs> I was doing the hangout on air, and it ended. Oh, how annoying! Why would it do that? Oh well, that was a noble effort that failed in complete and utter failure, and I have no idea why. What I do? It's like Google Talk plugin is just crashing. There's no way to keep going. Oh, well. Oh, how annoying. Okay, so I'll have to uh, ignore that part of what I was doing and continue on with this presentation. Although I was told that there would be a recording of this presentation. I sincerely hope so because my other recording effort has stopped utterly. Really distracting to hear user joined your channel, user left your channel. I'm not used to that. Oh, I'm so disappointed. I try to do interesting and novel things, and Windows 10 defeats me at every turn. Uh, okay. It crashed. <laughs> so, uh, if you're thinking, those of you who are in the audience here in this virtual world, if you're thinking, oh, how unusual, he's stopping, he's doing things, he's typing stuff, my real world presentations are like this too. So don't think that this is something unique to a virtual world. I'm always trying stuff. And in my real world presentations, I very frequently fail at what I'm trying to do. Uh, I halted an entire presentation once for 10 minutes while trying to get Skype to work. That was when I was doing uh, what at the time became the world's first Skype cast of a live conference talk, and that was in South Africa. And <laughs> Firefox can't find the server at plus google.com. So, so I'm thinking something's draining a lot of bandwidth, and I don't know what it is, but it might have something to do with virtual worlds. Anyhow, so 
Uh, so we've got simulations, we've got communities, we've got social networking. Let's add another thing to the mix. And uh, the other thing to the mix is, of course, mobile computing. Now, I, I threw a couple of links there on the slide. Oh, and that's in this side. All of these uh, slides will be available later. Um, but uh, it's a it's a pretty well recognized uh, recognized phenomenon that people and especially young people today are turning away from the traditional computer and more and more to the mobile phone, the mobile computer, uh, tablets to some degree, phablets, which are kind of smaller tablets, but not as small as phones, things like that. So that presents, on the one hand, some special challenges to the idea of virtual worlds, but on the other hand, it provides some opportunities. I'll tell you one of the challenges right off the bat. If I can't make this work in my environment with broadband cable internet and two computers going and cameras and all of that, then I can't make it work on my mobile phone. It just would not work on my mobile phone. So bandwidth and resolution and all of that are challenges that we're going to have to face. On the other hand, there are some opportunities presented to us as well. And the, these opportunities, I think, possibly outweigh, they, they outweigh the, uh, the disadvantages. So, let's think about what a mobile learning ecosystem would look like. And, you know, we, we're, we're moving from our individual computing space to a more personal space because this is a device that travels with us, but it's also taking us into an into interpersonal space because it travels with us while we do things. And, so we have to ask, when we think about the mobile computing infrastructure and the mobile computing ecosystem, uh, what are we going to do with it? Who are we going to do it with? Who are we going to do things for? I mean, what will the, the purpose of any of these things be? Um, in addition, uh, what roles will we play? Uh, what kind of things will we do? There's a way of looking at it from the perspective of the affordances that our system gives us. Uh, there, there are different levels of affordances. There are, for example, the capacity to communicate and to collaborate with others. There is the capacity to capture and integrate data. And this is, this is a very common thing. This is a very uh, a common thing for uh, mobile learning where you use your mobile phone, you go out to the world and you, you capture data or you record uh, interviews or interactions with people on the fly. Uh, there's, in addition, flexible physical access. And, and what that means is the capacity to uh, actually access local databases specific to wherever you are, uh, get for example, interactive prompting, uh, interactive prompting where, uh, you know, the, the classic cases advertising where you show something in your mobile phone and it pops up with some advertising or something like that. And then finally, the, uh, there are the productivity affordances, calendars, schedules, contact information, etc. 
So what kind of pedagogical affordances do these create? Well, the, the first thing that I notice when I look at this sort of document is that the, the affordances, the, the, the types of interactions here, again, are, you know, when we think of the, the social interaction that I talked about off the top of this talk, they're all communication kind of interactions. They're all uh, ways of talking with each other, sending content back and forth, receiving content perhaps in some sort of environment. But I'm thinking we should be able to do more than that. And I'm thinking that, you know, We've got the mobile phone, we have the virtual world support. We could have something like an as-lived virtual experience. So what would that look like? What would you know, mobile performance support look like with visual worlds? Now here I'm sort of thinking aloud a bit. I'm, you know, I'm kind of speculating, but there's already some thought that's been given to this sort of thing. For example, uh, the real world interaction with yourself in a real world with avatars. Now, this is the sort of thing that you might see in a heads up display. So, you know, maybe fancy glasses or something like that, where you're looking at the real world. And at the same time, as you're seeing the real world, you're seeing avatars or other artifacts from a virtual world popping up in it. On the other hand, we can take it even further. Here, for example, is the sort of thing we, ha we can have what's called ambient performance, where we are doing something in the real world, such as playing a real piano in the real world, but we overlay on top of that the virtual world. So people see me or see the piano player in the virtual world playing the virtual piano. This can be projected into other environments as well. So if we think about that sort of thing, we can think about the actual pedagogical aspects of that. Uh, what we're doing is we're creating real activity in a, an in-context location supported by our mobile phone where there is a virtual world overlay on top of that. The virtual overlay can help us project some of the activities that we're undertaking, activities such as playing the piano, such as operating machinery, etc. But even more importantly, the virtual world part of it can bring back the responses from the other, from the rest of the world, uh, the the reactions, uh, the effect of what happens when I do something, etc. I'm suggesting these as ways of teasing teasing your mind a little bit about what might be possible in these virtual worlds. So what would an infrastructure look like for that? That's, that's always a question that engages me because most of my work in the history, you know, in my history of educational technology has been to build infrastructures and such. Well, what we have here on this diagram, and this, this is a diagram that came from an article, Augmented and Virtual Reality, and we see an evolution of interaction where we begin, we're very far apart, the hardware, the interface, and ourselves. So the, the personal computer might be an example of that where the hardware sits on the desk and we sit in the chair and we need a screen or something to interact with each other. With things like the mobile phone, the interface and the hardware are almost one and we're moving closer and closer together. And gradually the interface and the hardware 
and our interactions with the device merge into a single kind of a system, a, a sort of search for the word, right? Um, a way of looking at it is by looking at the different kind of controls that are enabled. Uh, with the traditional computer, you had the point, the click, and the typing. And, and these were very clearly examples of us using an interface device to interface with the, the system. With the mobile with mobile uh, phones, and tablets, and phablets, we have more of a hands-on kind of interaction, the touch, the swipe, or perhaps the talk, if you're using Siri or something like that. Uh, but in the interfaces of the future, we're going to go beyond that, where our actual physical inter our, our actual physical actions will be the interface with this device. So our gestures, for example, the way we move our hands, our heads, what we're looking at, our mood, and other physical symptoms, uh, our heartbeat, our, our breathing rate, um, things like that, and of course our gaze, what we look at, what we pay attention to. So if we think of ourselves as being in a virtual world and being in the real world at the same time, the actions we take in the real world, looking at a lamp, looking at a chair, playing on a piano, whatever, are also the actions that we're taking, that we're undertaking in the virtual world. And so we have basically a meshing of the virtual world and the physical world. I think it's an interesting kind of infra infrastructure to think about, and it's a challenging infrastructure. So in this kind of environment, from, from the perspective of education, this you know, the sort of environment I've described could be used for almost anything. And indeed, it probably will be used for almost anything. Uh, we can ask, what will the educator's role be? What will the role of, of, of content producer be, uh, the person who actually creates the educational interaction? What will the role of the publisher be, uh, the, the, the company or the organization that produces the educational materials? And, and I think that these roles are going to be very different than they were in the past. Uh, we have, on the one hand, the idea of informal learning. Informal learning in the sense that in this interactive virtual world, uh, in context, in situation kind of learning, we're not dealing with the presentation of content, even like this presentation of content that I'm doing here, where I'm, I'm doing a talk with all of you. It's a much more informal kind of learning where the type of educational intervention is going to be one of support, of scaffolding, of helping, of providing aid, suggestions, and ideas, rather than, if you will, dictating a learning path. On the other hand, it's also an immersive environment. And so there's going to be, from the perspective of the publisher, a requirement to produce the mechanisms for this immersion to take place. And the designers of this virtual world will know well what sort of work is involved here. Uh, right now, just building an auditorium like this, this is one sort of thing, but user, oh, they've just started recording now. Well done. Uh, <laughs> um, so I guess, and now they've stopped recording. Okay, uh, so I don't know if there's gonna be any evidence of this. Uh, of this talk and user disconnected from your channel. Uh, we are constantly recording. Okay, don't worry. Okay. It's these voices in my head, and, and I wish you could see me. I'm holding my head. 
Uh, I have these voices in my head while I'm talking. It's very strange. So there's the design of this immersive reality, but it's an immersive reality that's going to have to work hand in hand with real reality. And so you can't just build auditoriums and escalators and fly and, and do whatever you want. It's going to have to be situated in a genuinely physical context. So you're going to be constrained by the physical reality. But at the same time, educational designers are going to need to offer supports, scaffolds, mechanisms for augmented cognition, mechanisms for performance, interaction, presentation, manipulation of the environment and more. How would you build even as a simple example, a real world classroom where a person who's in a virtual environment could manipulate the virtual environment and have it result in manipulations happening in the real world environment. I, I think that creates a challenge for the educational provider. So, As well, we consider what is the role of the educational institution. Right now, the educational institution is a place that you come to. It has classrooms. You go, you sit in this classroom, much like all of you are doing here today, and you receive instruction. We already know that this model is in flux. It's being changed a lot. There's the idea of what they call the flipped classroom, where the presentation of the material takes place outside of the classroom environment, uh, in the person's own computing environment, their own laptops, their own tablets, their own phones, whatever. We're thinking of things like TED videos and classroom videos and uh, even things like games and simulations, etc. And then in the classroom, if you have to go into the classroom, that's where interactive and collaborative activities take place that draw on the learning that you've done outside the classroom. Sounds like a great idea. And if you have lots of time outside the classroom, it is a great idea. If you don't have lots of time outside the classroom, it's not so hot. But in this new world where we're looking at people with their mobile devices who are interacting with the real world by means of a virtual world, what does the institution do then? Well, one of the major things that it's going to have to do is it's going to have to provide actual instances of this real world to interact with. There's going to be a lot of cases where we want to create a real world environment which is a simulated environment, although it's physically real, where we interact with it virtually, sometimes not in the same place as a physical environment, and have real-world reactions and results. I know that sounds like craziness. It sounds like madness. <laughs> um, but we're actually almost doing that now. For example, we have, uh, we have things like drones, uh, or, or other aviation simulators where there is an actual physical place that you go with physical controls and screens that make it appear like you're flying the airplane. Go into those, appear like you're flying the airplane, and then out there in the world somewhere is an actual airplane that is flying and this is what they do with drones, of course, right? Now, they don't do good things with drones. They, they do destructive things with drones. But we can imagine in the future where they're doing good things with drones, like inspecting power lines, uh, doing forestry surveys, doing crop yield surveys, all kinds of useful stuff from these virtual environments. So our educational institutions are going to need to provide physically real virtual environments where we work virtually producing real effects in real systems at a distance. It boggles the mind. 
uh, to be quite honest. So really, it's kind of an interesting thing, an interesting environment where just with our phone and the connectivity that our phone provides us, we're able to, if you will, live our virtual world on the go. We take our virtual world with us wherever we go. We interact with our real world via our virtual world. And somewhere out there are educators, educational providers, and all the rest of it, brain fog, Joe versus the volcano. Yeah, exactly. I love that movie. Um, out there are educational providers who are, I don't want to say orchestrating because that implies too much control, but who are, uh, well, orchestrating, scaffolding, providing the mechanisms behind these interactions, both on the physical level, the physical facilities, on the virtual level with virtual facilities and, of course, the interfaces and interactions between them. And then third, on the pedagogical level, facilitating the communications between oneself and other people in this virtual world and facilitating and providing feedback on the actual manipulations of that world, those manipulations being authentic practice in a virtual slash real environment. So that's basically what I had to say uh, today. Uh, my purpose was, of course, mostly to stimulate your imagination and give you a broader perspective than just this auditorium to think of for this uh, conference in the virtual world. So I thank you for your kind attention and we have time uh, for any comments, questions and other interaction. Or I can try to fly. <laughs> if anybody has questions, you can go ahead and put them in the local text chat. Uh, Stephen, you're, you're okay capturing them from there, right? Uh, I think so. <laughs> I saw the translation, so. In case you're wondering, I think my efforts to, to webcast this actually broke my other computer. I don't know why. Oh. Honestly, I don't know why, but it actually isn't working anymore. <laughs> Oh my goodness, our, our <laughs> virtual world broke the computer. <laughs> well, but my computer wasn't even attached to it. <laughs> <laughs> I think there's a question that just came in in local chat by Professor Dan. Are you conflating mobile phones and VR headsets when talking about the interaction of virtual world education? I thought about that. I thought about that when I was writing this talk. And of course, we have things like uh, Google Cardboard, which actually is a mobile phone, which is a VR headset. And I thought about Oculus Rift, of course. And I'm not sure, right? Um, you can use, and then we've seen examples of this, the mobile phone as a handheld heads up device. And you can't see my hand motion and I don't really know how to do gestures very well here. Um, but, you know, uh, for example, you look at a flower and you hold your phone up to the flower and the phone uh, camera captures the image of the flower and then there's this overlay of you know, the name of the flower, et cetera, et cetera, right? And uh, so is that the phone as a phone? Is that the phone as a VR display? Uh, or is it a third thing which we call heads up display? At a certain point, some of these categories begin to smoosh together. If I'm in an office, and I'm holding my phone in front of me, 
and my phone is projecting an avatar into the environment of the office. That VR? Uh, is it a virtual world? Especially if that avatar, the person running that avatar, is in an environment such as this one, then what is it? So, yeah, I get the question. <laughs> Um, but I don't think there's a clear answer for it because I'm not sure that the categories that we've used in the past work in an environment where virtual worlds, virtual reality, and real worlds and real reality all collapse into the same environment. Thank you. Uh, I am. Oh, is that someone Thanks. trying to talk to me? <laughs> <laughs> Quite possibly, yes. That's what instant messages. Um, <laughs> anybody else have any other questions for Stephen? We still have uh, about five minutes. I think that is it. This is this is a really interesting topic uh, in that you know we're we're all really so excited about our mobile technology, but you did mention some of the limitations of it, and and mm -hmm. and I, I really did like your diagram on on how we're actually getting closer, you know, to that it, it's a more personal experience even when you have your mobile, but there's there's still some limitations involved in that. Yeah, uh, and you know I always wonder. You know, the more, I mean, part of the problem with this is as these limitations disappear, so as the interaction with the computer migrates from devices like the mouse or the keyboard to interaction with the device itself, like swiping, to actually being our gestures or our gaze, etc. These interaction systems hijack, if you will, part of our ordinary functionality, uh, the things that we would otherwise be doing with our gestures or with our gaze. Um, like right now, I'm gesturing. Uh, nobody can see it, but that's what I do. But if my gesture now, my physical gesture actually made my avatar hand gesture, I'm not sure I'd be quite so natural and easy with my gesture. Well, I might be. Um, but now what if I'm walking down the road, talking on my mobile phone, or talking, just talking, because you know it's not even a, a mobile phone anymore, and I gesture and I turn off the system by accident, which is the sort of thing that can happen. Um, now, it means that in the back of my mind, I always have to keep in mind that the things that I do in the real world are also controlling the virtual world. And the things that I do in the virtual world are also controlling the virtual world. Um, you know, and you might think, well, okay, that's never a problem. But there's, there was a, a thing I saw uh, at, at a conference last week or the week before where uh, no, it was it was last Saturday, in fact, um, and there was a speaker from Intel or or one of the publishers or something like that. But they were showing a person looking at a screen, and the screen was on the back of their hand. And you think that is so cool? They don't even need a device. The screen is on the back of their hand, which is cool. But then I realize I'm looking at that, they can't use their hand for anything anymore because the screen is on the back of their hand. And if they move their hand, they move the screen away and they can't see it anymore. So we're gonna have a lot of these sort of tug of wars where, you know, uh, where the virtual and the real collide, not, not in the sort of sense that you might expect, but in the sort of sense where, the same thing is trying to do a bit of both. Uh, well, that's, James, a, that's an excellent point, yeah. James is asking, will the situation change 
when even the device is gone, meaning direct interface to the brain. This is actually the basis for some pretty interesting scientific science fiction novels that I've read. So here's the problem when the interface is direct with the brain. We really have to control what we're thinking, right? Because if I have a direct neural interface to a computer and I think, I want to blow up the world, um, depending on the computer system I have, I might end up blowing up the world, uh, which would be a bad thing. Um, that's for the CIA. It would be a bad thing. Thank you, CIA people. You can go back to listening to other things. Um, you know, even things like, uh, you know, you're in a conversation with someone and they say something and your first thought was, my goodness, that's so stupid. Well, if your brain is controlling your computer, that might be the thing you sent to that other person. And so now we've got a three-way tug of war. We have the physical, which is our real-world interaction with the other person. We have the virtual, which is the communications channel that we're using to interact with each other. And we have the mental, which is me having the freedom to have my own thoughts. My own thoughts are like, in this case, the surface of the back of my hand, right? Uh, you know, I'm using it for something else right now. I can't use it just to think and have my own thoughts. So it could get pretty crazy when we have direct neural interfaces to virtual worlds and physical worlds physical worlds via virtual worlds and vice versa. Yes, indeed. Well, thank you so much, Stephen. This was a wonderful talk. Uh, I had one question, and I think somebody else had posted in the audience as well. Uh, you had mentioned that you would have your slides available. Will you put those on SlideShare? or Because um, you can send me the link, and I can just post it to our community. Yeah, the, so the slides will be available, um, and uh, they'll be available on my website, which is www.downs.ca. But um, I can, I'll also post them to SlideShare. I have my own SlideShare account. And did you ask me just to mail them to you as well? I think I did mail them to uh, someone called, uh, get the name, <laughs> Sky or Ice Sky. If you sent right. it to her, I'll, I'll just grab the link from her. I sent them to her, but. Uh, I put the new fancy title page on the current set, so I'll send them to her again. I thank you very much. We appreciate it. And uh, everyone, please um, show Stephen our appreciation of his talk. Thank you so much for being here. Um, I know that it's getting uh, you know a little bit late uh, where you are, but we're very pleased and appreciative that you made the time to come. Thank you so much. My pleasure. It's a really interesting experience, even if it didn't all go perfectly. <laughs> Uh, I had a lot of fun playing with the system and talking with all of you.